but let me introduce uh, Louis. Uh, Dr. Louis uh, Hassel served a mission in Vietnam and, Hong Kong, and Hong Kong. Upon his return, he earned his uh, BS from Brigham Young University and MD degree from the University of Utah and completed his residency in pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He entered clinical practice in the San Francisco Bay Area and joined the clinical faculty at UCSF. In 1991, he relocated to Maine, joining Dull Chase Pathology Associates. Following a sabbatical leave period, Dr. Hassel then joined the faculty at the University of Oklahoma in 2008 as the Director of Anatomic Pathology. Since 1989, he has made frequent visits to Vietnam for humanitarian and educational purposes and facilitated a number of educational exchanges for Vietnamese physicians coming to this country. So if anybody should feel sick throughout this meeting, you know who to talk to. Dr. Hassel. So I'll first comment that I think I'm the only presenter today wearing a bow tie. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's because there are three kinds of people who can wear them. Uh, and most of you are not any of those three. And the three, th three kinds of people who can wear them are um, waiters and physicians and clowns. And after we're done today, you can decide which of those I, I fall into. So um, I'd like to, uh, yeah, with that disclosure, just uh, note that I have no finan pertinent financial relationships. This is sort of the traditional medical side of things. Um, and uh, so forth. But I'd like to begin with three stories, three little vignettes. The first is Nguyen Thi Ngoc Hom, and this is not her true name, but she came to the United States a few years ago to uh, get some further medical education. Uh, she left behind in Vietnam a few close relatives, but also had relations here in the United States as a result of the diaspora. During her stay, she came into contact with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She observed them up close, saw how they lived, saw how their values coincided with many of the things that she had been taught and yearned for in her growing up years. She observed them in their homes, attended meetings with them from time to time, and learned a few of the principles of the gospel. Following her return, she attended church with many of these people pictured here and had further association with the church in her native city of Ho Chi Minh City. Um, <coughs> shortly following her return, however, her mother passed away. Uh, leaving her and her brother alone in the world and somewhat uh, uh, wondering what to do and how to reconnect on se several things. Her relatives persuaded her to return here to the United States where she again reestablished connections with the gospel and found in the gospel a new home, ultimately being baptized uh, and finding that additional relationship of spiritual brothers and sisters along with her biologic relations that uh, now, now complemented her life. My second story is that of Nguyen Van Thie, a fairly well-known story as documented in his book, When Faith Endures, perhaps many of you have read that book. He first encountered the gospel in 1966 when as an <coughs> ably functioning English interpreter for USAID in Saigon, he stopped to help a young American serviceman uh, who was having difficulty with his motorcycle and the uh, translation with the uh, potential mechanic. Airman Moore asked him what he knew about the Mormon church, nothing. Uh, and ultimately, uh, addresses were exchanged, flannel board discussions ensued, and Brother Tay gained a testimony of the gospel. <clears throat> One might think that a Buddhist would be hard to convert to, to Mormonism. In my case, it wasn't as difficult as one might imagine, he said. Tay had been orphaned as a young, <coughs> young excuse me, Tay had been orphaned as a young boy when he was 10, had lost two siblings to death, had been abandoned by his stepmother, and ultimately left with just his sister to fend for themselves. Um, his surrogate parent, aunt, and uncle died shortly after, and thus he and his sister, through persistence, sacrifice, and diligence, had to work very hard to obtain a life for themselves. They were looking for something better. The presentation of the gospel message was understood because he could read and write and speak English and felt comfortable around Americans. It resonated in his heart. I had no difficulty believing in the eternal nature of families and readily accepted the notion that families could be sealed together. But the challenges of uphold, upholding family traditions as the oldest and only son in the family 
<coughs> for revered parents who had passed beyond loomed very large in his life. And the fear of offending his sister with whom he had experienced so much and with whom he had travailed so much caused him great pause in his decision. Even after he knew the gospel was the path where he needed to be, he was uncertain. His ultimate prayerful decision to receive baptism caused her, quote, to become bitter and full of shame for what his decision meant to her standing in the community. Our third story from Korea, another well-known story, that of Gim Ho Jik. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm not a Korean speaker natively, obviously. He was already a recognized leader in his country when he, following the spir a spiritual prompting, determined to sell his home and most of his belongings to provide an income for his wife and children while he uh, went to America to pursue studies at Cornell University. While there, he shared an office with an LDS member. The story is starting to sound familiar. Who ultimately gave him a copy of the Articles of Faith. Dr. Kim had been a searcher, a truth seeker, if you will, throughout his life and had joined several churches in that process. As he studied the Articles of Faith, it resonated. He later received a copy of the Book of Mormon and ultimately was baptized, recognizing in this at least one, if not the major, purpose of the Lord in bringing him to this land to find the gospel and thus be able to return and bring it in many ways to his countrymen in Korea. Following his return, he worked tirelessly to share the blessings of the gospel truths and the ordinances with his fellow countrymen. Now, the parallels between these stories are not insignificant. These are conversion stories, like every person's conversion story, and yet they are an archetype as well. A young seeker encounters new ideas at a time of personal and perhaps national or social upheaval, and through that encounter with a foreign person or a foreign ideal, accepts the new over the old. They encounter opportunity with that acceptance and also opposition as a consequence of the choice. It's a pattern that in many respects is not entirely new for individuals from these cultures by any means. Indeed, it has been happening for centuries as new religions have encountered these cultures in the form of a foreign group or perhaps even a colonial power. <coughs> and sometimes thus these decisions have been influenced by the search for political power, educational opportunity, social mobility, or otherwise. There are a variety of reasons for accepting these sorts of things beyond just the primary purposes that may be involved with a religious purpose. However, there are also some secondary losses or challenges imposed by the apparent abandonment of traditional beliefs in favor of the new. <coughs> in the larger context, I believe this pattern is one that has a mature path where individual adoption forms a stream that makes the culture itself different, richer, and wider as the religion becomes more and more engrafted into the social values and making the new <coughs> host culture itself uh, richer and more, more powerful. It identifies the symbols and idioms that make it native, the banyan tree, if you will, sending its roots down where it extends. So this is what we're, we may be aiming for. Several re thinkers have referred to this enculturation as the ultimate aim of a missionary-minded Christianity that seeks to resonate with the Asian soul. This destiny seems a long way off for Mormonism, particularly in Vietnam and perhaps in Korea, though the history of the church there is somewhat longer, and certainly for many other Western cultures outside of the Mountain West. But it bears keeping in mind as members and investigators wrestle with the decisions of membership and discipleship. What we've tried to do is take the issue of what, uh, and, and try to identify what the cultural, economic, social, and political environments of these two countries with somewhat parallel histories are that might influence individual decisions relative to the acceptance of the gospel. And then to take that to the next step and ask the question, how do those factors likewise influence the behaviors of these members once they uh, are undergoing a conversion and have accepted the gospel? To just reveal, re review briefly, I'll go through some of the history. These are countries that sit next to a 600-pound gorilla, uh, and thus their history has been strongly and heavily influenced by that gorilla, or gorillas, if you will, uh, because there certainly have been more than one. Vietnam's history is marked by repeated episodes of Chinese domination and war, which have left behind <coughs> both blessings and scars. Uh, many of their most celebrated legends, such as these of the two Trome sisters, uh, celebrate those times when they were able to triumph over their aggressors, their, their foreign oppressors. Uh, and yet they also have left behind a great rich treasure trove of language, of ideas, and other 
gifts. Similarly, the Korean culture has at times been invaded by its neighbors uh, and trampled upon in terms of their local culture, their local indigenous uh, beliefs by those who have come from outside to uh, gain access, to gain power, influence, riches, or whatever it might be that they came seek seeking. And they too have left behind their influence. One of the most painful of these periods for Korea was obviously the period of Japanese annexation. Vietnam also went through a very painful period as well when it was dominated by French culture and French uh, imperialism, leading to ultimately the rise of communism and nationalism in much this same period of time. The Second World War was a painful period of time for both of these countries when Japanese domination throughout the region imposed hardships on their culture and upon their people. Uh, these did not just disappear. They left behind an influence, both cultural and emotional, uh, that influence decisions today relative to foreign ideas and cult cultural issues. Ultimately, they led to a division of both of these countries. Uh, Vietnam at the, 30, at the 17th parallel, uh, divided with a demilitarized zone, as you know, uh, dividing these uh, north and south. Now, while this had been, to some degree, a historic division as well, and continues to be somewhat of a, a cultural distinction, if you will, uh, nevertheless, the people viewed their country as a whole and looked towards the day when reunification uh, could occur uh, in one direction or another. Korea, likewise, divided uh, by war and truce that persists to this day, uh, but still with some tension along that divi div division line. Not insignificantly, both of these wars were not just about political power, uh, but played out in the religious realm as well, as religious refugees fled south uh, from the north uh, the time of that division, and likewise fled south uh, during the time of the Korean War and conflict, thus concentrating to some degree some of these religious populations and religiously minded people uh, in different areas of the countries. From a religious standpoint, both groups, both countries have a very strong native indigenous tradition that antedates any foreign uh, imposed or foreign brought uh, visitor. In Vietnam, this is centered around ancestor worship and veneration of those who have passed before. In, Viet in uh, Korea, it's more the tradition of shamanism, which also has some uh, interesting ties to ancestor veneration and, uh, and worship as well. But the major influences were those left by the Chinese in the form of Confucianism, uh, Taoism, and Buddhism. In Vietnam, it's a combination both of uh, <coughs> Theravista Buddhism as well as Mahayana Buddhism, coinciding with the migra migratory patterns of people from uh, the, the north as well as from the west. Uh, in Korea, these influences arrived a little bit later in time than they did in Vietnam. Uh, but again, have been not insignificant in terms of molding the cultural mindset of the people. Uh, and based on those principles, governing relationships uh, of ruler to, to subject, of husband to wife, parent to child, brother to sister, as well as the search for harmony and an understanding of the balance of life and forces in, in life as well. Perhaps out of that has come a great uh, uh, not insignificant drive to harmonize many of the conflicting values that are presented to them uh, on the religious stage. In Vietnam, this is most typically uh, epitomized with the Gao Dai religion, which is what you might term a syncretive religion that embodies many ideas from both Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, as well as Christianity, and even espouses as uh, some of their modern saints, people like Victor Hugo. Uh, in Korea, uh, I apologize for my pronunciation on this, is that the Daijonggu uh, also might be viewed as a native religion that has some syncretive type of elements in terms of bringing in ideas and concepts that are not foreign to Christianity uh, as well as Buddhism. So what, about, what is a Latter-day Saint giving up to become, or to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? How is this viewed in these situations? Now, I think it's somewhat different in Korea than it is in, in Vietnam because Korea, in Korea, Christianity was not strictly a, uh, a foreign brought uh, religion. It was not necessarily a religion that was viewed as, as associated with imperialism, rather. 
Uh, so it was not associated with that. And in fact, some of the major growth in Christianity in Korea occurred during that period of annexation by J Japan when it became a very nationalistic or patriotic uh, source of solace and uh, rallying uh, for people to become Christian in that, in that venue. In Vietnam, it was a little bit different. And so many times people see themselves as giving up some element of their native culture to accept uh, Mormonism or Christianity because the, the stream of Christian belief is not as strong and not as strongly identified as being native uh, to their country. I've mentioned the ties to siblings, parents, and ancestor worship that may be seemingly need to be sacrificed on this altar. They may be giving up educational opportunities. Uh, as one of my uh, young colleagues says, whenever you apply for a job in Vietnam, you have to list on your application what your religion is. And their preferred answer is no religion. It's recognized that by putting a religion in that situation, you may be exposing yourself to vulnerability. Obviously, in today's world, political power, influence, membership in the church would eliminate the opportunity to hold any sort of public office as a uh, communist or otherwise. One of the things about the gospel is that it is involves covenants. And as missionaries are taught and trained to teach about the gospel, they learn to teach people how to make covenants. One of the things that they search for is to invite people to make commitments. This imposes a pressure, a, a pressure on people, which is a very painful thing in Korean culture. Anything that imposes pressure can be seen in that way. Similarly, in, in Vietnam, it can present a situation where you may feel like you're losing face, that you're not able to keep that commitment. Uh, <coughs> there is a determination to save face at all costs, that, which can lead people to do things that to s sometimes will seem inappropriate. The co excuse me, the contact who gives a faulty address, or the investigator who just suddenly is never there when you show up, who goes out whenever you have set an appointment, or even the situation that occurs not, un not, not unfortunately too commonly, where a formerly active leader uh, is released from a prestigious calling for another one, and then somehow lingers, falls off into inactivity because they have lost their social face. Now, interestingly, I think this actually, this value, a Confucian value to maintain one's public presence is actually something that the gospel need can particularly supply for these people. Because the process of repentance and forgiveness through the depths of humility truly can bring someone to have that sense of confidence, of having your confidence wax strong, if you will, not just in the presence of your fellow men, as people seek to with this public face, but also in the presence of God. It's important also, I think, to recognize that members of the church encountering uh, and dealing with the gospel principles of councils have some difficulties from these cultures. Because there's such a strong deference to the older, to the position of authority, there's a great reluctance to express opinions that may be seen as contrary to or feared to be contrary to those uh, which are uh, maybe held by others in, in a position of authority. And this can tremendously impede the ability of councils in these sorts of units to function effectively. This is a challenge for members of the church. There's also the challenge of living in a world, particularly in Vietnam, of a dual standard. People there are not taught the same principles of integrity and moral virtue that people are in a Western culture. In fact, there's a, a given accepted du dual duplicity to the fact that it's okay for my parents to lie about certain things, but it's not okay for me to lie to my parents. If it's, I can lie if it's to avoid shaming them or whatever it may be. And so that sort of duplicity has, you have difficulty placing that aside when you enter into a church context and you want to be a pure in heart. I think also the principles of independent action face challenges for people in these cultures where there's a, a tradition of centralized planning, such as in Vietnam or in North, North Korea, uh, it may be more difficult for people to engage in anxiously, anxiously engage in independent uh, activity and do many good things of their own free will without that imprimatur of superior authority blessing it for their good. So some of these issues also play out in language-based units elsewhere in the church. Although in these situations, many of these church units also play the, the role of actually transmitting these cultural values from the native culture. Uh, but it is not also improbable to see some of these issues 
come to bear as uh, immigrant populations deal with this challenge, with their children accepting new values, themselves facing that, and also with the situation where you have a large diaspora, particularly from Vietnam, that are of one particular persuasion, and people emigrating now having a different background, a different perspective on those, those uh, generational issues. Well, how does this all uh, play out as it may um, be germane to the potential spread of the gospel amongst those currently in living in North Korea? I think this presents some interesting insights into what uh, individuals in that culture will, will face as they enter into a post-communist era, uh, should that come to pass. Certainly their, their level of economic growth and so forth will also play a role in that, that dis discussion as was illustrated in some of the talks earlier this morning. I think these issues are not insignificant for church leaders who come to work in these populations, particularly if they're not thoroughly familiar with the cultural basis on which these perspectives are operating. And even sometimes when they are, because they're perceived as a person of authority, it's difficult for them to fully disarm those cultural biases, if you will, that might otherwise impair the proper functioning of the gospel in these situations. So I guess to summarize, uh, I think there's some interesting insights from the study of these two small countries in Asia and their acceptance of the gospel. Um, there are many long traditional values in these cultures that have fostered the growth of the gospel, their love for education, their respect for ancestors, and their respect for harmony in the world. The presence of communist rule has certainly impeded church growth in Vietnam and obviously in North Korea, and this poses a particular challenge for the growth of the church going forward, um, particularly if economic growth continues to accelerate at a significant pace ahead of the potential for church growth. As members accept the gospel from these cultures, they face some particular challenges in dealing with councils, in dealing with issues of integrity, in dealing with issues of individual action. And the enculturation of Latter-day Saint Christian values into these cultures has great potential to resonate in their hearts. Um, but it also has to happen in a way that is uniquely Asian and not in a way that may necessarily be what uh, a, a Wasatch Front Mormon or even a, a Western US European Mormon might as ascribe to. I believe the future is bright for these countries uh, as they accept the gospel and as you see the light of the gospel transforming the lives such as those people we talked about uh, in the beginning and as we see their progeny and their children growing and developing. And indeed the diaspora that has occurred has also been something that will continue to bless and enrich these cultures as many of their scattered Israelites uh, accept the gospel and return to share it in turn with their countrymen. Thank you very much. Thank you.